I think it's just finally loaded up. Hi, I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for day six of our read along together of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Let's see. We have today we're going to finish up with our visit to visit with the ghost of Christmas present. And then next week we'll get to conclude our story. Let's start out though with some tea. The tea that I'm drinking today in light of um, what we're reading and also because the passage yesterday about all the foods and the smells and everything was just so delightful, I decided I needed to have a Christmas tea. So I have more of that um, loose leaf organic Christmas tea, the blend with the, it's a black tea with cinnamon and clove and nutmeg. And I cannot even remember what else, but I had a whole bunch of stuff and it smells amazing, but it's just, yeah, that very Christmassy scent to it. Mm. Very fragrant, oops, very fragrant with all the Christmas spices. So lovely tea. Um, let me get my, my little thing there. Okay, so I thought we'd start out by talking a little bit about yesterday's reading. We read the first half of Stave 3, which is entitled The Second of the Three Spirits, and we know it probably better as The Ghost of Christmas Present. It started out with um, Scrooge deciding that he was not going to be caught un unprepared this time, that he'd be ready when that ghost came uh, upon him. And instead, he waited and waited and waited in his bed. And he didn't, unlike the first night when the ghost um, opened up the curtain of, of his canopy bed and he saw that first ghost of Christmas past, this time he kept waiting and waiting, but no one came in. And finally, he realized that there was some light in the opposite room. And so he went over there and he saw the second spirit. And this ghost probably looks the closest to what we think of as Christmas or as Santa Claus, although it's still not quite that. This ghost is vibrant and jolly, but this ghost is younger. This ghost is clad in a green, um, a green robe and no shirt, no shoes, no, you know, just like a very different kind of ghost than the one that we, sorry, than the, what we tend to think of as Father Christmas or as Santa Claus. Um, but still this ghost is, um, you know, is very vibrant and jolly. And so this ghost of Christmas present invites Scrooge to go with him to see what else is happening. And so as they explore, there is a very long and detailed passage by Dickens about the things out, like the what's going on at the poulterer shop, what's going on at the fruit, what's going on with, you know, like the, the different folks who are um, playing games, the merriment, the the food, the food, the food. It's a very detailed description. It is actually something that later since then has, you know, set the tone for what a lot of a lot of folks have aspired for what the to evoke that feeling of Christmas is the feeling of Christmas that Dickens described in this story, which was again, um, oh, of course I didn't bring it with me today, but that book, the one by I think it's Les Staniford, the the man who invented Christmas, goes it's a really fascinating book. And it talks about how at the time that Dickens was writing this story, Christmas was not a very widely celebrated holiday. It had fallen into disfavor during the Puritan era because um, it was, again, based on a lot of pagan rituals and celebrations. And so the, the Catholic Church and then later on the Anglican Church were both rather opposed to Christmas. It was seen sort of as a licentious holiday. People were going around and being... Um, hmm, perhaps a bit naughtier than nice. And so... Um, it was not a very well-regarded holiday by um, people in the church. And so when, it's interesting when Dickens decided he wanted to write a story about Christmas, like Christmas, why would you write about Christmas? Christmas is like a nothing holiday. It's sort of like, I think the analogy they used in the story is that it's a holiday that had meaning, but it was not widely celebrated in a large way. And so they said, I think the author in that one said that it was, might be sort of like Arbor Day, which again, a, a real holiday, but again, not perhaps as celebrated with as much fervor as Christmas, Thanksgiving, um, New Year's, Fourth of July in this country. So similar to that. So Christmas was not a huge holiday. And yet this detailed description that Dickens gives about the joy and the caring and the and, and such, it really colored what people aspired to create afterwards when they did their Christmas celebrations. And so it really turned the tide for how Christmas was celebrated in England, in America, across the world as people read this story and started to see Christmas as something more than they had done in the past. All right, so that very detailed description, absolutely beautiful. Um, 
we find too that this the spirit of Christmas present is able to sprinkle a little bit of extra joy on things with his torch, and he takes Scrooge to the house of Bob Cratchit, um, who is Mr. Scrooge's clerk. Um, we find there we meet the members of the family. We meet Mrs. Cratchit, his his two daughters, um, the twins or the little ones, the um the the elder son who is maybe perhaps going to start working pretty soon. Um, all of these folks come in, and then finally Bob Cratchit himself comes in carrying his youngest son known as Tiny Tim on his shoulder. And Tiny Tim has an injured leg and a crutch. Um, and again, but Tiny Tim is quite nice and quite thoughtful. And he, he, his father makes a point of saying how he even says, it's so good that people in the church see him because he was a cripple. And it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas day, who made the lame beggars walk and the blind men see. So again, he didn't despair of his own infirmity. Instead, he looked at it as an opportunity for people to think of who had healed the lame and the sick and, you know, in the Bible. And so um, a very, very sweet angelic child. And again, Tiny Tim becomes one of the favorite characters of the book for many who read it. So in the, so the rest of the section that we read was just talking about the feast of the Cratchit family. Also, I was going to mention to um, Helen, who's in our group, posted a link to some um, recipes um, for, uh, related to Dickens. And I was watching one of them last night for how to make Christmas pudding. And they explained something that I hadn't quite understood when I was reading the book. And so the, the woman who was a, um, a cook of historical kind of foods, she was saying how Mrs. Cratchit actually sends their goose to get cooked elsewhere because they don't have an oven that they can cook it in. And so I hadn't quite understood that part when they bring in the goose that, yeah, the goose is already cooked because they, they didn't, they were too poor to be able to bake it themselves or to roast it themselves. So they had to send the goose out to be cooked. Also, when they make their Christmas pudding, um, it wasn't a hundred percent clear to me. I thought it was just wrapped in a fabric and it was, but they actually had it in what they were using sort of like as a kind of a washing machine kind of deal. So that that's why it was cooking in that way. And so when they make their Christmas pudding, which is actually just a plum pudding, Christmas puddings were, they said, um, became popularized again after a Christmas Carol. Um, but the plum pudding that she makes, it is like the, the pièce de résistance, the, the, the crowning jewel after their wonderful Christmas meal. And the family's able to celebrate and love every moment. And Dickens makes a point of saying, even though the perhaps it might be considered a small pudding for a family of that size, no one in the family would have ever said such a thing. It would have been a flat heresy to say such a thing because, again, it was such a joy to the family that they were able to appreciate. Finally, um, oh, there, of course, is the wonderful line where Bob Cratchit says, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. To which Tiny Tim replies, God bless us, everyone. Again, one of the most well-known lines of the story. And Scrooge's heart is touched, and he looks across to the spirit, and he says, tell me, will Tiny Tim live? And the spirit basically says, no. If things don't change, if the present doesn't change sufficiently, then of course Tiny Tim cannot survive. That In future Christmases, there will be an empty chair and a, a crutch left alone because Tiny Tim would have passed away. And it's like things must change in order for him to survive. And um, Scrooge is sorrowful about it. Um, he also brings up, he brings Scrooge's own words back to him. And so you remember in the first stave when Scrooge was approached by the gentleman asking for a charitable donation, Scrooge had said, are there not workhouses? Are there not prisons? Are there not places for people to you know, work off their debt? Why would we give them charity? And you know, he said, if they, and people, if they don't want to accept that kind of help, um, then they should just die, you know, because that would decrease the population, decre decrease the surplus, surplus population, I believe is how he said it. And so at this point, the ghost turns those words back to him and says, if the shadows for Tiny Tim are unaltered by the future, you know, none other of his race will see this, this child again. But what then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the population, which again is exactly what Scrooge had said earlier. And the ghost, you know, really makes it plain to him that who are you to decide who gets to live and who doesn't? Who is it that gets to decide that in the sight of heaven that you are more worth, you know, more worthwhile or more worthless than somebody else? Um, and so Scrooge feels rebuked and is sad about this, but then he hears his own name and he kind of pricks up his ears and he finds that Bob's, Bob Cratchit has raised a toast to Scrooge's health to which Mrs. Cratchit says, 
him? Why would you ever toast him? Like, oh, if he wanted to come here, I'd give him a piece of my mind. And Bob Cratchit basically says, not now, not in front of the children. This is Christmas Day. And it's because of, you know, my job with Mr. Scrooge that we're able to enjoy this bounty that we are, we do have. And so the family does toast Mr. Scrooge, albeit perhaps not as sincerely as Bob Cratchit would have liked them to do, but they do. And the evening continues with them, you know, having a good time, singing. There's joy in the family. And finally, it's uh, the chap the section of the chapter that we read yesterday ended with Dickens saying, there was nothing of high mark about this. There was nothing particularly notable um, about the Cratchit family. They were not handsome. They were not well-dressed. Their clothes were far from being waterproof. Their, excuse me, their shoes were not waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And the elder son probably had been to a pawnbroker several times, like, because they didn't have money. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. So again, a very, very sweet scene where Scrooge realizes that there is more to, you know, what makes somebody successful. There's more than just having money in your coffers. There's having love, and there's having family, and there's just being a kind person, and that that matters so much as well. And so Scrooge is kind of trying to Re having to rethink what it means to be a worthwhile person. Um, and again, going back to the phrasing that we first heard in um, stave one, what is his business? Is his business the business of humanity or is his business just the business of his counting house? And he's rethinking that for himself. Let's go ahead and read the conclusion of stave three, which is again entitled the second of the three spirits. Let us continue. By this time, it was getting dark and snowing pretty heavily. And as Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, the brightness of the roaring fires in kitchens, parlors, and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Here, the flickering of the blaze showed preparations for a cozy dinner with hot plates baking through and through before the fire and deep red curtains ready to be drawn to shut out cold and darkness. There, all the children of the house were running out into the snow to meet their married sisters, brothers, cousins, uncles, aunts, and be the first to greet them. Here again were shadows on the window blinds of guests assembling, and there a group of handsome girls, all hooded and fur-booted and all chattering at once, tripped lightly off to some near neighbor's house where, woe upon the single man who saw them enter, artful witches, well they knew it, in a glow. But if you had judged from the numbers of people on their way to friendly gatherings, you might have thought that no one was at home to give them welcome when they got there, instead of every house expecting company and piling up its fires half chimney high. Blessings on it, how the ghost exulted, how it bared its breadth of breast and opened its capacious palm and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand its bright and harmless mirth on everything within its reach. The very lamplighter who ran on before, dotting the dusky street with specks of light, and who was dressed to spend the evening somewhere, laughed out loudly as the spirit passed, though little kenned the lamplighter that he had any company but Christmas. And now, without a word of warning from the ghost, they stood upon a bleak and desert moor where monstrous masses of rude stone were cast about as though it were the burial place of giants, and water spread itself wheresoever it listed, or would have done so, but for the frost that held it prisoner. And nothing grew but moss and firs and coarse rank grass. Down in the west, the setting sun had left a streak of fiery red, which glared upon the desolation for an instant, like a sullen eye, and frowning lower, lower, lower yet, was lost in the thick gloom of darkest night. What place is this? asked Scrooge. A place, oh, sorry, a place where miners live, who labor in the bowels of the earth, returned the spirit. But they know me. See. A light shone from the window of a hut, and swiftly they advanced toward it. Passing through the wall of mud and stone, they found a cheerful company assembled round a glowing fire. An old, old man and woman, with their children and their children's children, and another generation beyond that, 
all decked out gaily in their holiday attire. The old man, in a voice that seldom rose above the howling of the wind upon the barren waste, was singing them a Christmas song. It had been a very old song when he was a boy, and from time to time they all joined in the chorus. So surely as they raised their voices, the old man got quite blithe and loud, and so surely as they stopped, his vigor sank again. The spirit did not tarry here, but bade Scrooge hold his robe, and, passing on above the moor, sped, whither? Not to see. To see. To Scrooge's horror, looking back, he saw the last of the land, a frightful range of rocks behind them, and his ears were deafened by the thundering of water as it rolled and roared and raged among the dreadful caverns it had worn and fiercely tried to undermine the earth. Built upon a dismal reef of sunken rocks, some leagues or so from shore, on which the waters chafed and dashed the wild year through, there stood a solitary lighthouse. Great heaps of seaweed clung to its base, and storm birds, born of the wind, one might suppose, as seaweed of the water, rose and fell about it like the waves they skimmed. But even here, Two men who watched the light had made a fire that through the loophole excuse me that through the loophole in the thick stone wall shed out a ray of brightness on the awful sea. Joining their horny hands over the rough table at which they sat, they wished each other Merry Christmas in their can of grog, and one of them, the elder, too, with his face all damaged and scarred from hard weather, as the figurehead of an old ship might be struck up a sturdy song that was like a gale in itself again the ghost sped on above the black and heaving sea on on until being far away as he told scrooge from any shore they lighted on a ship they stood beside the helmsman at the wheel the lookout in the bow the officers who had the watch dark ghostly figures in their several stations but every man among them hummed a Christmas tune or had a Christmas thought or spoke below his breath to his companion of some bygone Christmas day with homeward hopes belonging to it. And every man on board, waking or sleeping, good or bad, had had a kinder word for one another on that day in the year and had shared to some extent in its festivities and had remembered those he cared for at a distance and had known that they delighted to remember him. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind, and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss, whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while thus engaged, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. Ha ha, laughed Scrooge's nephew. Ha ha ha. If you should happen by any unlikely chance to know a man more blessed in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is, I should like to know him too. Introduce him to me, and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things, that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his heads, and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, roared out lustily, Ha ha! Ha 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 ha! He said that Christmas was a humbug, as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it, too! More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, 
exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory, too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure that he is very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's niece. At least you always tell me so. What's of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking <laughs> that he is ever going to benefit us with it. Hmm. I have no patience with him, observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everyone else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they just had dinner, and with the dessert upon the table were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I am very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper had clearly got his eye upon one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereat Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. Do go on, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, clapping her hands. He never finishes what he begins to say. He is such a ridiculous fellow. Scrooge's nephew revealed in another laugh, excuse me, Scrooge's nephew reveled in another laugh, and as it was impossible to keep the infection off, though the plump sister tried hard to do it with aromatic vinegar, his example was unanimously followed. I was only going to say, said Scrooge's nephew, that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge. But being thoroughly good natured and not much caring that they laugh, excuse me, but being thoroughly good natured and not much caring what they laughed at so that they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment and passed the bottle joyously. After tea, they had some music. For they were a musical family and knew what they were about. As when they sung a glee or catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one and never swell the large veins in his forehead or get red in the face over it. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp and played, among other tunes, a simple little air, a mere nothing you might learn to whistle it in two minutes, which had been familiar to the child who, fet who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school, as he had been, excuse me, as he had been reminded by the ghost of Christmas past. When the strain of music sounded, all the things that ghost had shown him came upon his mind, 
he softened more and more and thought that if he could have listened to it often years ago he might have cultivated the kindness of life for his own happiness with his own hands without resorting to the sexton's spade that buried jacob marley but they didn't devote the whole evening to music after a while they played at forfeits for it is good to be children sometimes and never better than at Christmas when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop! There was first a game at Blind Man's Bluff. Of course there was. And I no more believed Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew and that the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister and the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, on purpose, he would have made a feint of endeavoring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair and it really was not. But when at last he caught her, when in spite of all her silken rustlings and her rapid flutterings past him, he got her into a corner whence there was no escape, then his conduct was the most execrable. For his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress, and further, to assure himself of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger and a certain chain upon her neck, was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it when, another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind, blind man's buff party, but was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits and loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. Likewise, at the game of how, when, and where, she was very great, and to the secret joy of Scrooge's nephew beat her sisters hollow, though they were sharp girls too as Topper could have told you. There might have been 20 people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for, wholly forgetting, in the interest he had in what was going on, that his voice made no sound in their ears, he sometimes came out with his guest quite loud, and very often guessed right, too, for the sharpest needle, best Whitechapel, warranted not to cut in the eye, was not sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood and looked upon him with such favor that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guests departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. Could not be done. Here is a new game, said Scrooge. One half hour spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the rest must find out what he only answering to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge. Which it certainly was. 
Admiration was the universal sentiment, although some objected that the reply to, is it a bear, ought to have been yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. Oh, he has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, said Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this because the Christmas holidays appeared to be condensed into the space of time they passed together. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until they left a children's twelfth night party, when, looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that its hair was gray. Are spirits' lives so short? asked Scrooge. My life upon this globe is very brief, replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight, cried Scrooge. Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at that moment. Oh, forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. But I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of its robe, it brought forth two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at his feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh man, look here, look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostate but prostrate too in their humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat them, excuse me, where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacing. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade through all the mysteries of wonderful creation has monsters half so horrible and dread. Scrooge started back, appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say they were fine children, but the words choked themselves rather than be parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude. Spirit? Are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them. And they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. This girl is want. 
Beware of them both and all of their degree. For, but most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I see that written which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Deny it, cried the spirit, stretching out his hand toward the city. Slander those who tell it ye. Admit it for your factious purposes and make it worse and bind the end. Have they no refuge or a resource? cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons? said the spirit, turning on him for the last time with his own words. Are there no workhouses? The bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley and, lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground toward him. That is the conclusion of stave three, the second of the three spirits. On Monday, we'll come back and we will start stave four, the last of the spirits. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, it's getting quite dramatic now from the lightheartedness of the Christmas descriptions of the feast in yesterday's reading. Now we've met ignorance and want, and we will see what is to come um, through the visions of the ghosts of Christmas future. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you have a great weekend, and I will see you next Monday. Bye, friends.